I'm Larry Goldstein. I'm a professor of cellular and molecular medicine at UC San Diego. And I have the great pleasure today to interview my friend, colleague, comrade in arms, uh, Paul Berg, Nobel Prize winner, and also a recipient of the Public Policy Award from the American Society for Cell Biology. And I'm going to ask Paul some questions about his life as a science policy advocate and uh, public figure. So, Paul, thank you for taking the time to join me today. Thank you. Good. So, so let, let's start at the beginning. Uh, you had a very illustrious career in science, but something made you decide to leave the lab at least part of the time and engage in policy debates. What, what was it that brought you out for the first time? Well, it certainly wasn't voluntary. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it turned out that an experiment which we had planned and were in the midst of elicited a lot of concern amongst yeah. other scientists. The experiment we had in progress was to fuse a small mini chromosome of yeah. containing lambda, lambda genes yeah. and three genes of E. coli, the gal operon, yeah. and we fused that with SV40 yeah. to okay. make a recombinant that contained. Right. Now, this recombinant could propagate an E. coli because it contained the parts on the yeah. mini plasmid which allowed it to propagate in coli, and it could also be propagated and transfect mammalian cells. So it was kind of a dual-headed thing. And what we wanted to do is to be able to make mutations yep. in the SV40 genome in coli and then test them in, in yep. mammalian cells. And the other thing, we were going to test and see whether the, the gal genes could be expressed ah, in mammalian right, cells. Right. So that was the idea of the yeah. experiment. The point was that we were going to be propagating SV40 genes in E. coli. Right. right. So the concern was co coli is a natural inhabitant yep. in humans. And the concern was, inadvertently, could you infect humans with the E. coli you were propagating, and could that possibly lead to cancer? Right. That was the concern. And depending upon where you came down on the topic, you were either vociferous about it, yeah. or you were just saying, forget about it. It's not serious, okay? Uh, but I soon, after a lot of consultations, I said, became convinced that I could not dismiss the risk yeah. And make right. it zero likelihood. And so I thought, well, we'll just put it on the shelf. And so the whole thing died down. Yeah. A year later, or well, not quite a year later, Janet Mertz, a graduate student in my lab, discovered that ECO R1 made cohesive ends. And she discovered that she could take any two DNAs and join them together. <laughs> and so Stan Cohn and Herb Boyer then began to actually make a lot of recombinants using E. coli plasmids. Right and checking drug resistance and showing that they can make chimeric yeah. DNA molecules. Um, and they talked about it at a Gordon conference and that elicited the same kind of response amongst a uh -huh. small minority of the right. audience right. who said, oh my God, you guys can really make some dangerous things. So what happens is at that Gordon conference, they got Maxine Singer and Dieter Saul, who were the yeah. co-chairs, to draft a letter to the Academy. Mm -hmm. and to publish that letter in Science, calling attention to the great promise that being able to make new kinds of DNA molecules, uh, but also calling attention to possible dangers and risks. Right. And when the president of the academy got this letter, he said, what do I do with it? And Maxine said to him, call Paul Berg, because <laughs> he's thought about this right. problem. Right. And so he asked me, would I put together a group of people that could advise the academy on how to respond to the concerns right. that had been raised? And um, so I did. I put together a small group and we met at MIT. Mm -hmm. Dave Baltimore, Dan Nathans, myself, Jim Watson, uh, a few other, uh, Norton Zinder, people who would understand the nature of the problem. We met for a whole day, yep. this group, and in the end, there was no advice that we could provide. We didn't know what to do. Huh. So we said, you know, literally you could pick up the phone and call everybody of your scientific community who's likely to use the technology and say, hey, be careful. Yep. But we couldn't do that. So we said, well, the next best thing is why don't we just publish a letter in science, calling attention to the promise, mm -hmm. to some of the potential risks that have been raised, and essentially calling essentially asking the, the scientific community 
to put a short hold on three kinds of experiments. We didn't call for a moratorium on yeah. all this kind of work. Yeah. It was three kinds of experiments that we specifically called attention to. And in the letter, we proposed having an international conference <laughs> some six or eight months later to examine the risks in more detail right. and come forward with some right. recommendations. I think the scientific community got a lot of good kudos from the public right. saying, here's a problem, scientists called attention you to it. You actually got out in front of it. And they're proposing how to deal with this thing. Yeah. So if you look back now, you say, I got into public policy through my own experiments yeah. and just being called on to say, what do we do yeah. when somebody raised the risk? So the initial so-called moratorium letter, which came out yeah. of the group, uh, called for a meeting to deal with it. And so we convened, I was the chair of convening the, the Silmar meeting, mm -hmm. and the organizing committee was Maxine, Dave Baltimore, myself, Zinder, Sidney Brenner, we had a, a person from Europe, and we were gonna organize a meeting of experts to try to assess what was the magnitude of the risks, what was the likelihood right. of them coming true, right. and how could we proceed in any case. Okay, so the Silomar meeting was a major event. Mm -hmm. 150 people, huge representation from the media, which was probably one of the best things we decided. There were 15 people really? from press wow. and wow. newspapers, magazines, and so on. Um, and in those three days, we debated. What are the kinds of experiments yeah. you want to do? What are the possible risks? Yeah. And we organized it very well so that the meeting was not all talking about risks, it was talking about science. And that was probably a saving grace to the yeah. why the meeting succeeded, because people came prepared to talk about scientific experiments, and they were balanced by discussion. There's a lot of interesting science came out of the Asilomar meeting. Yeah. One was the safe bug to engineer a microbe right. which could not escape from the lab. Right. Okay. So the crippled hosts. The crippled host. Right. And the second one was actually, that, so that was Sidney Brenner's idea. It's a good idea. He brought that yeah. to the meeting, and, and I think that was turned people around a lot because suddenly we could answer the question that you could devise the experiments in some way which would markedly lessen the likelihood yeah. of escape. Yeah. yeah. So this organism wouldn't be able to live outside the lab. Okay, so there were a number, so right in that meeting, you could see science taking over. People beginning, with, well, we could do this. Well, and, and I think you and I would agree, if you're gonna have good science policy, it has to be yes. driven by good yes, science, right? right? It, yes. Misunderstanding is not gonna get the job right. done. Turning point of the meeting, frankly, was the last night when the lawyers had their session. Oh. And the ethicists. Yeah. We'd invited a group of lawyers and ethicists. And, and did the lawyers and ethicists sit through the science as they well? They participated in everything, Fantastic. as did yeah. the press. Yeah. The press were free to ask questions, yeah. raise points, yeah. and in the drinking in the evenings, they milled around, <laughs> and they were yeah. full members of the, huh. the, of the meeting. Um, the lawyers pointed out the legal problems right. and challenged Jim Watson with the idea because he had now turned and he was totally opposed to any kind of uh -huh. regulation. Right. Whereas he'd been a signer of the original letter. Um, they said, we'll close down, people could close down Cold Spring Harbor if there's any danger or anything that happens. Um, and then people's own personal risks were begin to right. play on. And eventually, I think everybody said, we cannot walk out of here tomorrow morning saying we don't have any advice. So right. that night... Well, especially with the press there, because exactly. they were going to cover it, right? And that night, I and Maxine and Dave and Sydney, we drafted a set of guidelines huh. and recommended that the NIH use this as a, as a sort of outline right. for a set of guidelines that would essentially determine the conditions under which this research could yep. be done and under conditions in which it should not be done. And so the whole thing that came out was very positive. We debated it and voted on segment by segment oh. until when noon came and we had to leave. We had an approved list of regular... Of was it unanimous or was it consensus? No, no, there were, uh, I would say it yeah. was 
That's pretty good. In favor. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Going forward, even though the language was muddled and yeah. things like that, but we all agreed that we would smooth things out. Yeah. So I worked on the language, and Dave did, and Maxine, and we finally got a document, which is now recorded as a famous document yeah. out of the yeah. Basilomar conference. We look back on it and we say, you know, we a bunch of amateurs. Yeah. We mumbled through a <laughs> bunch of stuff. We made some decisions that were smart in retrospect. Yeah. For example, one of the things we did not do and did not include in any way agenda was the ethics. We didn't uh, talk about right. genetic testing. We didn't talk about that. Right. We talked about real experiments yeah. and what the impact of those experiments would be in the field. So there were agriculture, nitrogen fixation. You know, people had all kinds of ideas of what we call the low-hanging fruit. What were the things the you were going to do right away? Fruit, yes, Clone right. insulin yeah, gene, right. well, clone growth hormone gene. Yeah, right. All of those things were yeah. obvious. In retrospect, when you look back, you say, most of what's happened, nobody even could conceive of at the time. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the way science goes. You make a slight breakthrough, you got a lot of very smart people out there. Yeah. Very smart people figure out very quickly how to use this new notion, new tool, or whatever, and the field explodes, and yeah. that's what's happened, yeah. and why yeah. recombinant DNA it's has fantastic. had the impact yeah. that it has. So when, when did the Congress get into the act? When did the politicians decide that this was something they should worry about? Okay, so the, the, Congre the uh, Solmar meeting was held in February of 1975. Yeah. Uh, the rest of that year, there were small groups that were meeting to devise the guidelines. The guidelines came out in the summer of 76. Yeah. And that ruled the day. And then sniping occurred. Mm -hmm. And the sniping occurred from different people who said, well, these guidelines are not rigorous enough or we don't trust the scientists to abide by them. Congress began to respond to these little barbs and they set on a course that they were actually going to prohibit recombinant DNA right. research in the country. And I remember spending a lot of time in Congress, and I can remember vividly one senator from Arkansas, who's normally a liberal and was a pretty good guy, getting up and saying on the floor of the Senate, I never got through high school chemistry, and I don't profess to understand any of this science but I believe this is the most dangerous work ever undertaken in this country, and I would recommend prohibiting it. Yeah. There were a lot of people who shared that view, and I am cynical enough to now realize that what changed the whole picture yeah. and obliterated the concerns was the founding of Genentech and the first day's stock issue. Ah, money. <laughs> money. <laughs> Suddenly, <laughs> it became clear that this was going to be a commercial right. entity and important, yeah. and to put any prohibitions on it was like shooting yourself in the foot, and the whole thing disappeared. So the promise of making insulin for kids was not the winning message, you think? Or it was a message, but when you actually saw something happen, yes, that it was no longer been, virtual. I believe yeah. that was the thing that actually was a switch, huh. and the atmosphere changed completely as soon as it became a couple of companies starting up to take advantage of this technology huh. to do huh. this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. So, so ultimately, the resolution of this was, if I understand, if I remember correctly, no law was ever passed in the Congress. No law was ever passed. And it was all done by scientists driving the development of good regulation through the funding bodies, which then spread. Exactly. Amazing. It's a fantastic example. Yeah.